Now, let us turn our attention to still another important feature of this habit of performing more service and better service than that for which we are paid. Namely, the fact that we can develop this habit without asking for permission to do so. Such service may be rendered through your own initiative without the consent of any person. You do not have to consult those to whom you render the service, for it is a privilege over which you have entire control. There are many things you could do that would tend to promote your interests, but most of them require the cooperation or the consent of others. If you render less service than that for which you are paid, you must do so by leave of the purchaser of the service, or the market for your service will soon cease. I want you to get the full significance of this right of prerogative, which you have, to render more service and better service than that for which you are paid, and this places squarely upon your shoulders the responsibility of rendering such service. And if you fail to do so, you haven't a plausible excuse to offer or an alibi upon which to fall back if you fail in the achievement of your definite chief aim in life. One of the most essential yet the hardest truths that I have had to learn is that every person should be his own hardest taskmaster. We are all fine builders of alibis and creators of excuses in support of our shortcomings. We are not seeking facts and truths as they are, but as we wish them to be. We prefer honeyed words of flattery to those of cold, unbiased truth, wherein lies the weakest spot of the man-animal. Furthermore, we are up in arms against those who dare to uncover the truth for our benefit. One of the most severe shocks I received in the early part of my public career was the knowledge that men are still being crucified for the high crime of telling the truth. I recall an experience I had some ten years ago with a man who had written a book advertising his business school. He submitted this book to me and paid me to review it and give him my candid opinion of it. I reviewed the book with painstaking care, then did my duty by showing him wherein I believed the book was weak. Here I learned a great lesson for that man became so angry that he has never forgiven me for allowing him to look at his book through my eyes. When he asked me to tell him frankly what criticism I had to offer of the book, what he really meant was that I should tell him what I saw in the book that I could compliment. That's human nature for you. We court flattery more than we do the truth. I know because I am human. All of which is in preparation for the unkindest cut of all that I am duty-bound to inflict upon you. Namely, to suggest that you have not done as well as you might have done for the reason that you have not applied a sufficient amount of truth set out in Lesson 8 on self-control, to charge yourself with your own mistakes and shortcomings. To do this takes self-control and plenty of it. If you paid some person who had the ability and the courage to do it a hundred dollars to strip you of your vanity and conceit and love for flattery so that you might see the weakest part of your makeup, the price would be reasonable enough. We go through life stumbling and falling and struggling to our knees and struggling and falling some more, making asses of ourselves and going down finally in defeat, largely because we either neglect or flatly refuse to learn the truth about ourselves. Since I have come to discover some of my own weaknesses through my work of helping others discover theirs, I blush with shame when I take a retrospective view of life and think how ridiculous I must have seemed in the eyes of those who could see me as I wouldn't see myself. We parade before the enlarged shadows of our own vanity and imagine that those shadows are our real selves, while the few knowing souls with whom we meet stand in the background and look at us with pity or with scorn. Hold on a minute, I am not through with you yet. You have paid me to delve into the depths of your real self and give you an introspective inventory of what is there, and I'm going to do the job right as nearly as I can. Not only have you been fooling yourself as to the real cause of your failures of the past, but you have tried to hang these causes on the door of someone else. When things did not go to suit you, instead of accepting full responsibility for the cause, you have said, Oh, hang this job. I don't like the way they are treating me, so I am going to quit. Don't deny it. Now, let me whisper a little secret in your ear, the secret which I have had to gather from grief and heartaches and unnecessary punishment of the hardest sort. Instead of quitting the job because there were obstacles to master and difficulties to be overcome, you should have faced the facts, and then you would have known that life itself is just one long series of mastery of difficulties and obstacles. 
The measure of a man may be taken very accurately by the extent to which he adapts himself to his environment and makes it his business to accept responsibility for every adversity with which he meets, whether the adversity grows out of a cause within his control or not. Now, if you feel that I have panned you rather severely, have pity on me, O fellow wayfarer, for you surely must know that I have had to punish myself more sorely than I have punished you, before I learned the truth that I am here passing on to you for your use and guidance. I have a few enemies, thank God for them, for they have been vulgar and merciless enough to say some things about me that forced me to rid myself of some of my most serious shortcomings, mainly those which I did not know I possessed. I have profited by the criticism of these enemies without having to pay them for their services in dollars, although I have paid in other ways. However, it was not until some years ago that I caught sight of some of my most glaring faults which were brought to my attention as I studied Emerson's essay on compensation, particularly the following part of it. Our strength grows out of our weakness. Not until we are pricked and stung and sorely shot at awakens the indignation which arms itself with secret forces. A great man is always willing to be little. While he sits on the cushion of advantage, he goes to sleep. When he is pushed, tormented, defeated, he has a chance to learn something. He has been put on his wits, on his manhood. He has gained facts, learned his ignorance, is cured of the insanity of conceit, has got moderation and real skill. The wise man always throws himself on the side of his assailants. It is more his interest than it is theirs to find his weak point. Blame is safer than praise. I hate to be defended in a newspaper. As long as all that is said is said against me, I feel a certain assurance of success. But as soon as honeyed words of praise are spoken of me, I feel as one that lies unprotected before his enemies. Study this, the philosophy of the immortal Emerson, for it may serve as a modifying force that will temper your metal and prepare you for the battles of life, as carbon tempers the steel. If you are a very young person, you need to study it all the more, for it often requires the stern realities of many years of experience to prepare one to assimilate and apply this philosophy. Better that you should understand these great truths as a result of my undiplomatic presentation of them than to be forced to gather them from the less sympathetic sources of cold experience. Experience is a teacher that knows no favorites. When I permit you to profit by the truths I have gathered from the teachings of this cold and unsympathetic teacher called experience, I am doing my best to show you favoritism, which reminds me somewhat of the times when my father used to do his duty by me in the woodshed, always starting with this bit of encouraging philosophy. Son, this hurts me worse than it does you. <laughs>